When we think about defenses, it is a good idea to have in our minds a couple of big overarching characteristics. And these are actually dichotomies. There are two of them. Is the defense constitutive or is it inducible? And is it innate or is it acquired? And these lead to some of the major issues about uh, how effective the defense is, under what conditions it's deployed, and what kind of a disease it might be associated with. So when I say design considerations, I'm really thinking about evolution as a process that produces a design under constraints of costs and benefits. So whether a defense is constitutive or inducible depends on how much it costs, what its deployment requirements are, that is, how fast can it be brought, brought into effect, and whether the hostile environmental factor is always there, occasionally there, or just there periodically. Most defenses are inducible on demand because they cost a lot and they are not needed or they're even detrimental if the threat's not there. They are actually an excellent example of George Williams' functional criterion for recognizing what is an adaptation. An inducible defense is arguably virtually always an adaptation produced by natural selection, and we can see that because it's only expressed when the threat is there, and when it's not there, when the threat is not there, the defense is not expressed. The costs of much of the immune response, so energy, immunopathology, collateral tissue damage, and so forth, are just too great to allow constitutive activation. So if you're not infected, you don't want those things going on. It has low cost components, secreted defenses and immunoglobulin A. They are constitutive. They're there all the time because they don't damage tissue and they don't cost very much. So there are some issues with induction. When do you induce a defense? If there are several different defense mechanisms that can protect from a given challenge, then they are induced in the order of increasing cost. First you do what's cheap, and then only if that doesn't work do you do something that's more expensive. So avoidance is usually cheaper than repair. Anticipatory responses can be induced to a challenge that occurs with predictable periodicity. So if something is coming up seasonally, physiology can be prepared for that. Actually, we all undergo yearly fluctuations in our weight. We tend to get heavier in the winter and lighter in the summer. And that has to do with thermal responses and thermal regulation. Or we can also detect a proxy that will signal the upcoming arrival of some kind of threat. For example, starvation in the womb and in neonates alters metabolism for years. It protects the developing brain but it creates risks of late life, late, late life diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease, what's called the metabolic syndrome. And we will go through that in some detail. Hormesis is a very interesting case. An innate defense can be adjusted by experience. So in fact, a prior exposure will lead later to a better response. If there has been a previous exposure to a noxious factor, then in the future, the response will be more efficient and it will be more rapid. So that's hormesis. If a patient has been exposed to a low level of toxin, that can induce the expression of detoxification genes so that subsequent exposure to otherwise lethal doses can be tolerated. On a somewhat more mild level, um, if you are planning to have an alcoholic binge, it's probably wise to have small amounts of alcohol for several days continually, and that will actually upregulate your ethanol detoxification genes in your liver. A more extreme case is something like Valentine de Villefort in the Count of Monte Cristo. In, in her case, what happened is that Edmond Dantes anticipated that a bad person was going to try to poison her, and he gave her small quantities of the same poison so that when she actually was poisoned, she went into a coma, but then she recovered from it. 
Now, hormesis is something like acclimation, but they operate on different time scales, and actually hormesis is usually applied to a discrete exposure, so you get a, a dose of poison. Well, acclimation is a term that's usually applied to continuous exposure. So the temperature is gradually getting colder, and there's physiological acclimation to that temperature trend. Uh, oxygen tension is increasing or decreasing uh, as you go up or down a mountain, and various physiological mechanisms kick in to uh, give you a better blood uh, a supply of red blood cells or to change other aspects of dealing with oxygen tension. So here is a picture of Valentin de Villefort. This is a 19th century illustration of the Count of Monte Cristo. And this was a well-known situation that people would protect against poison that way. Now another consideration, design consideration for a defense mechanism is whether it should be reversible and over what period of time does it occur. So inducible mechanisms are reversible, but rapid physiological adaptation is something that can happen in seconds to minutes. So hyperventilation, shivering, increased heart rate, that can switch on very quickly. Lipolysis, gluconeogenesis, and the immune response operate on a scale of hours to days. It usually takes about three days for the adaptive immune response to recruit a cell population that's really effective. Acclimatization is something that oper operates on the scale of days, weeks, months, and even years. So as people say move up into Tibet or into the Altiplano in Peru, they are undergoing, if they're going from sea level up to, up to high altitude, changes occur in their bodies which uh, accumulate actually over years and people who are living continuously at 15,000 feet have enormous rib cages and huge blood volume and huge respiratory capacity but it takes a long time to build that up. An extreme and often irreversible form of adaptation is developmental plasticity. So that is induced at an early stage and it lasts a lifetime. That would be something like age and size at maturity. So maturation just happens once and when it happens it fixes body size and then that endures for the rest of life with many consequences. So if we think about the time scales on which these things operate, we have homeostatic feedback loops that are physiological and in terms of generation time, they're operating at a tiny fraction of a percent of generation time up to about a tenth of a percent or so of uh, one percent of generation time. Acclimation is something that is going on at uh, about, say, a tenth of a generation up to perhaps a quarter of a generation, something like that. And part of acclimation is rheostasis. So a rheostatic mechanism is one which is resetting the controls and that causes changes in set points on homeostatic controls. And then there's developmental plasticity which is often irreversible and usually operates at the scale of a full generation. We also have special issues with immune and cognitive defenses and interestingly not only do the immune system and the central nervous system communicate with each other but they share some design features. Defenses that are mediated by the immune and the nervous system both have an innate and an acquired component. Acquired and learned defenses are very flexible. They can be adjusted to unpredictable environments, pathogens, predators, toxic plants, venomous insects, things like that. And they also have the benefit of memory. So both the immune system and the central nervous system can remember. The immune system is thus like the nervous system, and they do communicate with each other. There's a chapter in Evolution and Health and Disease, second edition, that discusses exactly how this can happen. And interestingly, it can play a role in human mate selection. So flexibility is a great thing, but flexibility has costs. Although most invertebrates are relying for defense on a innate immunity and behavior, whereas both 
vertebrates use innate and adaptive immunity in behavior, it's not really clear what all of that wonderful flexibility in vertebrates really brought them. After all, if we look out at the world, what we see is we see that there are a lot of invertebrates and there are a lot of vertebrates and they're both doing just fine, thank you. So the question is, why was it that this flexibility of our innate immunity and our behavior evolved? Although the adaptive systems of vertebrates are, have some clear advantages, they create vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities are not present in invertebrates. Autoimmune diseases, allergic responses, mental disease, and various behavioral abnormalities, like paranoia, are not present in invertebrates. They are diseases probably caused by the flexibility of our impressive ability to learn and to remember. So the costs of flexibility include the risks of new kinds of disease. Here is an illustration from 1838 of multiple sclerosis where the base of the brain and the spinal cord are actually being attacked by cells in our adaptive immune system. And then just a reminder that something like paranoia is a disease of a brain which has tremendous capacity to learn and it has uh, quite a bit of emotional intelligence, but if that's exaggerated in the wrong way, it can lead to pathology. So homeostasis is something that has also its own benefits and its costs. Homeostatic systems that are very adaptive, that is, they have multiple set points, they are rheostatic, they evolve to optimize adaptation to different needs and environments. So moving up mountains, uh, doing a lot of diving and swimming or something like that causes major changes in the way that the body deals with oxygen. A single set point system is actually rather resistant to dysregulation. It doesn't have this adaptive ability, but it doesn't lead to a disease of homeostasis. So a multiple set point system is vulnerable to dysregulation and it can permit a disease of homeostasis simply because something can go wrong with the set points. So the same mechanisms that evolve to change set points with adaptive consequences enable dysregulation and diseases like type 2 diabetes, gout, and some kinds of obesity. So the central thing that's going on here is homeostasis and how it's regulated. And the man who gave us the insight into the importance of homeostasis was Claude Bernard, a great French physiologist. And he uh, discussed the importance of what he called the constancy of the internal environment, la constance du milieu intérieur. Uh, and it was one of the major advances in medical science in the 19th century. It is a 20th century insight that the dysregulation of homeostasis is the thing that leads to some of our most severe chronic diseases like diabetes, gout, and obesity. So here is gout and here is obesity. I have, I have gout occasionally and I can tell you that an inflammation of the joint at the base of your large toe is no fun at all. So to summarize, defenses are inducible when they are costly, and most of our defenses are costly. Redundant defenses are induced in order of increasing cost. Hormesis occurs when a first exposure to a threat induces a defense that makes the later exposure less harmful. Uh, this has long been known in civilizations that have poisoners in them, but you're also from probably familiar with it in, in the sense that uh, the tanning of your skin by exposure to the sun reduces the subsequent impact of sun exposure. Induction of defenses takes time. It can take seconds to months. So that is one of the uh, design considerations in deployment and in the sequence in which defenses are activated. 
Adaptive or acquired defenses in both the immune system and in the central nervous system have the benefits of flexibility in memory, but they do make us vulnerable to kinds of diseases that are just simply not present in organisms that don't have that flexibility.